Hello and happy Friday. I'm Abby. We're here with From Belly to Baby and I'm really excited about our topic this week. We've got Cameron Christman Robbins back, OBGYN with Washington University and um, Barnes Jewish Hospital yes. and Katie Drennan and I am going to mix up your institution. So you're WashU and Barnes and Jewish as well. Mm -hmm. Okay and you are a labor and delivery nurse. I am. I trade. So tell us a little bit about, we, we know what Dr. Robbins does. Tell us a little bit about so, what you do. I've been a labor nurse since 2005. I took a small break in 2015 when I joined the WashU group as their um, educator and now clinical nurse coordinator. Um, so before that, I did everything on labor and delivery from staff nurse, triage nurse, charge nurse, transport nurse, bereavement nurse, um, preceptor, all of the above, and love taking care of women and, and their newborn babies. All right, so you've got it all handled. Most of the time. And I think we're going to test a little bit of knowledge. And we lured her. <laughs> we lured her into our practice because she's the best. I love it. It's, yeah. it's so nice to see moms from the very beginning to the end, and then they come in with their little sweet babies. And a lot of times, if we have a fussy baby, I get to snuggle the baby and get you know my little my little love out of the way. And go home to two crazy kids. So I was say, do you need to say hi to the two crazy kids because they're going to watch it later? Yes. Okay. My oldest, Evan, wants to watch later. Hi, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably not being watched in, what, second and third grade classrooms? Yeah, first grade, I told him that okay. may be a little inappropriate and his teacher may not appreciate it. So you're welcome. Okay. Well, we are talking birth Wait. Point. Oh, sorry. Hi, Dory and Joey. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I've never, never said, hi, said hi, to hi to them. I did say hi to Owen. So hi, Owen. Sorry. Yay. Two and a half, so he probably won't get <laughs> She's the girl mom, I'm the boy mom, mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. and I'm the mystery mom. Yeah. So today we're That's talking, my favorite. we're <laughs> talking, <laughs> thank you, thank you, um, we were talking about birth plans today, or as I was quickly corrected, birth preferences. Yes, yes. yes. please. All right, so I, there are a lot of big decisions that I think we're encouraged to make before we go into labor. Um, a lot of ideas that I think we have on that day and how things are gonna go. And so we're going to address them as the hour goes on. Um, we'll point out, first of all, that you may have to escape because you do have a patient in labor right mm -hmm. now. I'm so. wearing my scrubs today <laughs> because I'm on call for labor and delivery. So we it's are going to, um, it'll be great, no matter what. You got this one. So it's all live. But so if you wait. hear a knock at the door and <laughs> she drops out of the room, <laughs> she's going to catch a baby. Yeah. Um, and uh, so any questions you have, Feel free to post them in the comments. I have a feeling we're gonna have a lot of good ones today because I know that I read through some stuff online. I googled, sorry, and there are some definitions. And I'm smiling because really, I was I was just saying I read some of this stuff and I was just crossing my legs and hoping for the best because I thought <laughs> this is just nuts. I cannot believe the things that are supposedly um, possible in the delivery room. So first and foremost, I think the big question that people talk about, and it's something that you address even before you take um, a class about labor and delivery is whether or not you want, I don't know if, it's, if the appropriate way of phrasing it is, an epidural or medication or those kinds of things. Can you talk a little bit about that choice and what should go into it, or at least that plan? Oh, that's so hard. It's so hard, it is. isn't it? It's, it honestly comes down, and I, I don't want to take your, um, take it. how you handle pain. You know, everybody handles pain differently. We could all three just have different ways that, you know, some people get in the shower and they feel 100 times better when they have PMS or cramps. And other people are like, oh, I need to go to the hospital. And other people are like, I go to work and I'm fine. So I think it comes down to what you personally can handle and just being very open to it. Because you talked about like plan versus preference. And I like the word preference versus plan because sometimes when we have our mindset that something's going to go a certain way and it doesn't, it's you are crestfallen. You feel like, like you're a failure. Yes. You feel like you're devastated. You didn't do something right has nothing to do with that because you got pain medicine doesn't make you a failure. It just means it was more than you could handle. And that's okay. You just have to be open. Next step. Next step. What are the possibilities? So, um, you know, we want things to go how they're supposed to go. We want you to be comfortable, but we know labor itself is not 100% pain free unless you're one of those, I don't know, less than 1% rarity <laughs> people. Oh, so um, you're saying there's a chance. There's, there's a chance. <laughs> um, but kind of just take it step by step. Yeah. It, you know, go into it, if you don't want an epidural, go into it open-minded that I will do what I can to get there, and if I don't, then this is what I'll do. Can you imagine, can you imagine going to your endodontist and saying, here's my plan. Mm -hmm. I would like you to remove my wisdom teeth um, with no inhaled gases, no narcotics <laughs> afterwards. No injections. Because I have Googled this, 
and this is my preference for my wisdom tooth removal. Like, you would never, you would never feel bad about yourself for needing help to get through that sort of procedure. And I feel like there's this funny, it's like that intersection of mystical goddess, woman energy, control thing with childbirth that negates truly what is happening. Do I need to say what's about to happen? <laughs> I think we all know what's about to happen. <laughs> that worries Abby a bit. It does. I was say, <laughs> what's about, about to happen? happen? I feel like my eyes <laughs> are going to get bigger and bigger. And but, I lose my context in the middle of this. I'm sorry. They might just fall out. But there, you are a freaking warrior. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If a baby comes out of your body with or without an epidural. Vaginal or C-section. Honestly. Vaginal or C-section. You are a warrior. You still so, get a beautiful trophy. Yeah. So so do your thing, but just be open and please. It's like a war isn't it the worst when somebody feels like yes. a failure? Yeah. You're not a failure. 100%. You're when just, they need pain medicine. Mm-hmm. So it's just hard. It's hard. Because you're delicate balance. Yeah. I need to I need to be writing these questions down. But one one question I have is first of all is um, is there, are there any advantages to going without pain meds? I mean you hear things about recovery time is faster and um, I'm trying to think of other other things that I've heard about recovery time being the biggest one. Recovery time is quicker too if you like as your discussion with Dr. Dickinson, um, staying active, mm -hmm. a good diet, you know things like that. Those especially those last couple of weeks. That's what in the recovery in the long run helps you, I think, probably the most mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. leading up to it. If you sat on the couch and ate ice cream and chips all day, I mean, of course, I mean, sometimes that sounds glamorous, but staying mm -hmm. active, right? Say, what, if, what if you stay active and then come home and eat the ice cream? I know, right? Yeah. All, right. all in moderation. Okay. Yes. Get your 300 mm -hmm. extra calories a day, all in moderation. Which is pitiful. I know, I mean. know. But having a little Ted Roots <laughs> or something every once in a while mm -hmm. is okay. Um, but I think that also helps in our recoveries. There's our latest there opportunity for sponsorship. <laughs> I think, yep, yeah. you can you get, I was going to say, can you get a concrete name after yourself there? That'd be exciting. <laughs> That'd be neat. Um, we have a question. Oh, yes. Alrighty. So Jocelyn wants to know when's the last possible moment you can get the epidural if you choose to wait during labor. You can get it if you can sit still. For our institution, I guess we should preface. For our, and yes, that's our okay. whole, that's our whole thing for this yes. whole series is yes. I'm sharing my practice patterns based on where I work yes. and how I trained and Katie similarly with the Barnes Jewish perspective. But if you can sit still and you're completely dilated, but you would like an epidural for the pushing and the sewing afterwards, if that's something that needs to happen, our anesthesiologist will happily mm -hmm. give you your epidural. They are available, which is typical that they are available. They will be right in to, to do that. 24 hours. Huh. And then I think we should just make a clarification. So Heather pointed out that she thinks her drug-free delivery was pretty amazing and she preferred that. So I think we should make it clear that we aren't saying not to do drug-free. It's no. more just for women no. not to feel bad yes. about Correct. whatever choice they make. Correct. Yeah. And I think the public perception sways to women feeling bad when they need pain medication. I don't. Th I've never counseled someone in the office who feels badly that she chose not yeah. to use medication. So I'm, I'm allaying mm -hmm. the, the greater volume of fears that I deal with every day. Gotcha. I'm here to support if you do oh not want pain medication. We just did two yesterday. Two yeah. deliveries that was without nice epidurals. I think a lot of people have the perception uh, that with major hospitals and I mean, you drive by these big fancy buildings that have yeah. all the fancy technology and is it an option? to go without an of epidural course. that is your preference of course. we have you know and i can i'll grab the ball in just a second but you know there's things that we pull out of our sleeve we have the birthing balls we have the um the bars we have bars in the middle of the hall or down the hall that you can squat in and use i had i had a ballerina one time that's what she used for labor because that's what was comfortable for her and i mean yep. beautiful plie as she um, <laughs> labored i was like my goodness i mean you few times i was like oh but it's but that's why we set up labor the way we do, so that yeah. they have the um, the monitors that you can wear, um, that you can be out of the room walking in the hallway. We try sometimes to avoid medications for a little bit if we need to, um, so that you can walk and get labor started. I'm gonna grab the ball so we can actually okay. show kind of how that's you. Say, really we'll start with yeah. that, and then yeah. we'll go in, we'll launch into a bunch of the questions. There's a, yes, mm -hmm. you said this one's a little more inflated. This is a little bit inflated. Um, so Dr. Kristen Robbins is actually gonna do it rather than Abby. Because I'm wearing a skirt. She's wearing Shots. a skirt, and I don't want her to visit triage today. So um, I'm gonna put you up here, come around the front, and we're gonna, and let me can know you see her? Yeah. I wasn't aware of this plan. <laughs> <laughs> do, so you mean, do you mean, I know my head, I need my head too. Oh yeah, you'll be good. Okay, so I'm sitting. So you're gonna kind of, you're a little bit longer length than me, my legs don't touch. So you okay. kind of, so if you have a pregnant mom, um, you wanna support her getting onto the ball. Even at home, sometimes dads and 
um, other people can get involved with this part too because you know, sometimes our center of gravity gets a little off. I went to grab the mm -hmm. phone, even just playing on this earlier about fell off, they laughed at me. Um, so what you can do is, in labor or even pre-labor, is you can mm -hmm. sit. This kind of helps kind of open up your pelvis, just kind of loosen things up, and you can rock. You can bounce, okay? And even in labor, this is something we typically use because it's easy and moms are comfortable on it because mm -hmm. you're taking that, mm -hmm. that painful chair or couch or bed and giving them this nice, soft, kind of open. And Actually, this is nice. If you want to, my back is no, I feel so good. rude. Um, if you do labor without an epidural for a mm -hmm. while, you can explore things like this. Yes. So you can try the ball. You can try, um, you know, sort of leaning. We can raise the bed really high, and women can sort of lean on the bed while they're standing and kind of rock their hips back and forth. You can use um, this ball against the wall yep. and kind of use it to like just take that lower back pressure off. Yep. So those are mm -hmm. other options. There are so many different things you can do with a birthing ball, yeah. even postpartum. We've talked about yeah. this. You get an upset baby who is used to being rocked and bounced in mom's womb, and mm -hmm. you sit on a ball and bounce and rock that oh baby, gosh. and all of a sudden you're like, yeah. In my mind, I was I was getting ready for you to say you put the baby on the ball. Like, no! <laughs> <laughs> mom or dad can sit on the ball, and, and, and you just kind of give it a good yeah. bounce. And, yeah. and all of a sudden you have this like, Baby. And so. our our perfect epidural does not render you motionless. Mm -hmm. In a perfect world, you have an epidural, but you can be up on your hands and knees on your bed. You can be flipping from side to side. You can adjust your blankets. I mean, you're you can have a dense epidural where you really can't move from the waist down. Mm -hmm. But it's, rare. it's so rare. Yeah. We really try to run it. The infusion is run by our anesthesiologist to the minimum amount where your pain is controlled, but you're able to to have some range of motion. Okay, all right. Um, so the you're showing this and talking about being up and moving yeah. and everything during labor. You don't see that on sitcoms and on television. Because mm -hmm. I, I was looking at some of these preferences that you mm -hmm. outlined, and in my mind, you, <clears throat> you have a baby laying in a hospital bed. I mean, that's how you do it. But there are a lot of different, I don't know if options is the right word, but a ways, a lot of different ways to approach it. So I think, can we just start, I know we talked about a number of different things, so talk about some of the preferences that you really feel like women should have in mind maybe before, or at least have considered prior to labor. Like birth positions? Um, well, we'll start with, let's start with, first of all, um, who's in the room? Oh, I think that's so personal. Yeah. I think you really want somebody that not only supports you, um, because when you are, you feel very vulnerable when you're hurting, um, if you're doing it with or without an epidural, there's some sort of, at some point you're going to hurt, um, something will be uncomfortable. So who in that moment can kind of focus you in, bring you in? Mm -hmm. These are strangers within the hospital. So it's hard to rely on your nurse or, um, the tech, somebody like that. So finding somebody you're super comfortable with, being um, comfortable with your physician, I think that's also really key. Having discussions ahead of time and being comfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're not comfortable something maybe you need to look for a different position but having discussions ahead of time so that going in um, you know your doctor says oh you said mom and um, your husband were gonna be here for delivery is mom coming in oh mom's down getting a coffee she'll be right back so that way everybody's kind of on on board but I think it's mm -hmm. personal I think it's it's who mm -hmm. you're comfortable with don't yes. feel pressured to have people in the room I guess is another <laughs> there's like an element of now. well <clears throat> I think the idea of a big crowd mm -hmm. um, appeals more to younger patients who are delivering, and this is just my pattern of what I'm seeing um, in terms of having your three sisters and your six best friends from school, and your, I mean, it can get really crowded, we and at some tickets. point, I was going to say, that's, um, that's a lot of people it's watching a lot something, and, and rather, in a very small personal. area, <laughs> yeah. and it's a fine line between supporting someone's mm -hmm. wishes and actually maintaining a safe environment for your medical yes. care providers to be able to be heard when they're speaking to you or maybe needing to speak to peds or babies. I mean, there's there's a balance there. So I think maybe having a list of, in a perfect situation, the, these folks would be great to be here. Mm -hmm. And then what's your next tier? Like, if it gets too much, if I'm in pain, I want these two people here, for example. And also checking with your hospital in terms of what their visitor policy is. We're actually crafting a little bit of a policy here because we've had some situations where it was just hard for me to even speak to the patient um, because there were so many people in the room. So we don't have a, a anything yet, but we're working on it because it's all about keeping the mom in the center and the dad. and. 
Because when you um, get too many people there, it becomes about and them. The baby. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It gets too... It's, you're worried about so-and-so and what they're thinking and what... Are they yeah. posting it on Facebook yet? Don't post it on Facebook yet. You know, yeah. it gets to be too much. But yeah. I think thinking about your core people as well as maybe your, your semi-expanded circle if, yeah. if things are going well and you're feeling confident and comfortable. Okay. And about how long... I know that's a silly question, but how long can labor take before you eventually call it and <laughs> yeah. go in and get the kid? Yeah. It can take a long time to get to six centimeters. That's kind of our cutoff for what active labor is. Mm-hmm. So latent labor is from no contractions, no cervical change, up to six centimeters, and that has a wide variation in timing. Mm-hmm. Once you hit six centimeter, centimeters, um, oversimplifying it, but we want to see hourly cervical change, thinning, dilation, something. And if you stall out, if something about your body got to six centimeters Mm -hmm. and then you stall, that's kind of us thinking, is the baby big? Is your pelvis small? Is your uterus not contracting to the extent that we would like it to? So we typically sort of get involved if you get stuck somewhere after six centimeters. Okay. And is that where, and I should have asked you this before we even got started, because I, I honestly do not know the answer to this, membrane stripping? Oh. Membrane stripping and is in the office. It is. Okay, and is that an option? It is. Oh, for people? Yeah. And is it is it something that you decide, or that your practitioner decides, or is it It's a, a discussion. Okay. Yeah. Because before we're going to do anything to a patient, it's a discussion point. Like yes. They're not going to okay. walk in and be like, you know, you do this to you, and you'd be like, what just happened to me? Okay. Um, what is it? So... Uh, you're probably better off to describe. So, uh, 39 weeks, <clears throat> if you can get a finger on sterile vaginal exam, if your provider can get a finger through the internal opening of your cervix, so mm-hmm. remember your cervix is like a tube, so it's got the outside opening that's in your vagina and the inside opening that's by baby's head, hopefully that, <laughs> they're stripping <laughs> membranes. Um, and if your cervix is shut and I feel your cervix and I can't get anywhere, I can't get up to that bag of water around baby. But if your cervix is even a centimeter open, I can put my finger through the internal os or the internal opening and do a big sweep and physically, mechanically separate the bag of water from the lower uterine segment and without breaking it. But that sweep, in theory, releases some mediators of labor. Now, it's not like I stripped your membranes, you're gonna go into labor. The only thing we know about membrane stripping is it decreases the likelihood that you're gonna to get to 41 weeks without labor. So if you okay. can strip membranes, you will be less likely to need an induction for post dates after 41 weeks that you will, of your own accord, go into labor. Okay. Do gotcha. you need to ban you? you I, I think I'm okay. I'm okay. <laughs> that was not as horrific as what I was expecting. No, I don't know yeah. what it was. I was expecting something more Stephen yeah. King than that. So I appreciate it. Now, if a woman will go back to the, to the topic King. at hand, <laughs> the, um, the idea that someone comes in and, and I, if you look up birth plans online, you're going to find several page long documents that have checklists and things in it, which is where I learned the term membrane surfing. I know what it was before that. What is, what is your response when a woman comes in and says, here's my plan and hands you a several pages long document? Mm-hmm. How do you think that's something that you encourage or is it something that you say okay this is a starting point for a conversation absolutely start it's a great conversation and you can just go through one by one and talk about it i also tell moms if they say they're working on one or would like to know what they should put on one or mm-hmm. where they should look you know we do discourage the internet because it's so much click and choose click and yes. choose um they're awfully pretty though they did oh, do a nice yeah, job of making right? those forms because yeah. then you just print yeah. off and it looks nice yes and, I'm like, write down some things you want. You know, there are things that here at Barnes that we do automatic that are all over those birth plans. I want my baby to stay with me. Okay, we're automatically gonna do that. Mm-hmm. You know, I want lactation to see me um, an X amount of time. Okay, our goal is to have lactation see you. They're not here at night, but you know, tomorrow morning they're going to see you. Um, so I think taking some things that you read in there and you bring it in as a discussion point, or um, it's it's not as nice when you show up at the hospital with it for your doctor to be like. Okay, uh, but having that discussion ahead of time so we can cross things off that we do automatically. We don't, you know, we don't routinely cut episiotomies here. It's not something, and that's a discussion point. Like, so an episiotomy, I'm say what? Yeah. <laughs> I turned my heart for like the medical. I have right? a general idea. Yeah, so that is a huge one that comes up almost every time somebody has a discussion. Birth plan. I don't want an episiotomy. I always say, well, we don't want to do one. No, that's not. It's not, it's routine. not routine. It used to be mm-hmm. in the 70s. 
seventies and nineties. So it's just it's a it's a you take scissors, scissors and cut someone's the skin at the opening of their vagina, so there's more room for baby. Okay, and if you don't do that, are you destined to have somebody who tears or is potentially? The um, goal? You could tear further with the episiotomy, making it a you know even worse than what it would have been if you would have torn your own. Um, I think they just it's just standard there, and so sometimes that's the big thing that on stands out to place, people. Yeah. Yes, on the so that's why I'm like write down things that you prefer. What is it that you want in your birth? You know, that way you can ask and that continued conversation will keep going through your labor. That way if something changes, okay, well, you know, you couldn't labor in the tub because your blood pressure was too high. What can we do in this bed to make you more comfortable? Can we get the ball? What can we do to um, help you reach this next goal? And we'll backtrack just, oh, we've got a question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Laura said she's planning on an induced epidural birth and a few mm -hmm. days before due date, a few days before her due date because she's taking blood thinners. Do you guys have any advice on what she should eat or do the night before or morning of going into being induced? In terms of eating? And do you get typically instructions from your own physician? As yeah, so she'll get really specific instructions about when to stop whatever medication she's on. Um, and really nothing nothing specific i mean i think eating something light i always tell patients something light that if you throw it up you're not gonna yeah. forever hate that meal i was gonna say a friend yeah. of mine can't eat lifesavers to this day no. <laughs> yeah yeah there's something about it your nerves get the best of you um hormones it depends on how far you're dilated you may be four centimeters they break your water it kicks in and all of a sudden you're like a, a puker during labor happens to I'm sorry um it can a, help. yeah it can we help. actually think it's a good sign that's what I was getting ready to say but then you never want to eat that again so something light like if you're going mm -hmm. in for an induction maybe some toast or a little bit of oatmeal something like that mm -hmm. and can you eat during labor I know one of the mm -hmm. suggestions that you had was to talk about queer liquids and things like that do you eat during the day at all do you drink I mean how does that yeah. unfold well you always have an IV um, for labor and delivery we just we need it um, for access. A lot of times you do have fluids going just to give you that little bit extra, a little sugar water. Um, we do allow some juice. I think we're kind of going now with a low fat mm -hmm. um, diet here at Barnes so that you can have um, things maybe a little bit lighter again, maybe a, a sandwich or something, not chicken tenders, french fries, those kind of fattier mm -hmm. things that um, aren't as, are as, if you're going to be sick or something like that, aren't as good for you. Or if you okay. need an emergency C section, this is all anesthesia yeah, driven. Uh -huh. It's not necessarily. It's just to keep you safe yeah. if you need to go to sleep for emergency surgery. Um, Starvation is not our goal. No, 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 no. That's <laughs> we a good point. We will feed you as much as we can after yeah. delivery, but initially it's... We just want to be safe yeah. if surgery is needed. Okay. And so then the other thing that comes up a lot of times with, with plans in a conversation that's probably worth having before we see more often now than before is whether or not you can take pictures or video within the context mm -hmm. of the delivery. Is that something you encourage people to do, or is it is it legal everywhere? It's your hospital policy. Refer um, to your hospital's policy. <laughs> yes. yeah. So there you have special or certain policies about not only um, labor but the physicians, your staff, um, because you at Barnes you technically can't take pictures of staff without their permission. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's a fine line. And that's across, that's not just OB, that's yes, the hospital. Yes, the hospital. So it, it, we're now in this very high tech, nobody has their phone in here, but very high tech Facebook um, live you like? now. Um, yes, yeah. I mean, you can take videos yeah. and so it's a fine. fine From line. the mom's shoulder down mm -hmm. with the permission of providers, um, baby is fine. But if baby goes to the warmer here, pediatrics recommend, asks for no video until the baby is stabilized. So there's, um, you just have to be communicating at your hospital, whatever your hospital's policies are, um, can you communicate with the doctors in the room taking care of you. And the objective is, of course, to make sure, it's, it's not to do anything but make sure that the people who are working to, to ensure that the two patients or three patients or however many are in there, can do their job. Yeah, it's very distracting to be trying to resuscitate a baby and have a relative kind of leaning in with a camera. It's just, mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. we need to be focused. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Any yes, we have another question. So Lex says that she had a C-section after an 86 hour induction due Aww. to failure to progress. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even said, know how many days that is. It's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
Oh. So she said she had no complications other than she actually felt a bit of the C-section. So she's heading for a scheduled C-section in July. How is this one going to be different than the first one since she's not going to be induced? What's her experience going to be or, you know, this time versus mm -hmm. last? I think she'll be delighted. Yeah. <laughs> You're probably, yeah, you can speak yeah. that more. So this is my life story. <laughs> I just told Facebook Live about my life story. And your daughters. <laughs> and my beautiful daughters. Um, but this is my story, so I can speak as somebody who's done, I don't even know how many C-sections at this point, but after having had a scheduled C-section after a prolonged failed induction, long story. But anyway. Um, oh, so you're saying this happened, that exact same me, scenario happened me. to you. Okay. Okay. For sure. We changed her name to Cameron. Okay. Yeah. So, um, but I will tell everybody, imagine, you know when your baby's going to be born, you have what you want to eat. The you can look before. like this. I was going to say, I bet you your hair out. Exactly. You pull your hair hair. out. You're not swollen and exhausted from all the IV fluids and the prolonged pitocin so and everything. You haven't brushed your teeth in 80 but two hours. Oh but you show up. They give you a nice, probably spinal, depending, maybe epidural, and your baby's born. It's so nice. It's, um, I fully, fully support people who want a trial of labor if they're a good candidate after, sounds like you already have a plan for C-section, so please don't take me as saying, that anybody out there who wants delivery, yeah. <laughs> I know, it's so hard. Um, but you're gonna love it. It's gonna be so calm. And especially in comparison to what happened. Exactly. It's, it's comparing and the two. And look at this, like, you're owed. Yeah, yeah right? Six hours and yeah. labor, you just I hope you get a great. really good gift. Get yeah, a exactly. photographer. Get a photographer to come yeah. and take beautiful pictures of and you with your and makeup artist. Yeah. <laughs> say, that's a nice one. And um, you feel better faster. That's the other thing. You like, can, and you know what to expect. Feel better faster from... A scheduled C-section instead of 80 was. hours. Okay. Of, I was going to say, because yeah. I think that's an important distinction because, you know, we... As a hospital, I know it's discouraged, or as medicine in general discourages, a planned C-section for the sake of planning a C-section. I mean, yeah. am I saying that correctly? I mean, in terms of depends who you ask. Having oh really? Yeah. Why did we'll we talk that? later? Okay, well then we'll table that one for now. But um, if you really want that, please, whoever you are, wherever you live, talk to your obstetrician. Mm -hmm. I'll do that for people. But you have to have the conversation. Have the conversation. You have a conversation, and Don't you probably nervous. have one or two conversations, but yeah. you talk it out. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, for sure. We have patients that will come in, and they're like, this is what I'm thinking. Okay. That so, counts as a birth plan. Yes. A birth but preference. preference. Mm -hmm. So Really? Yeah. It, and it's not that we're tabling it by saying, like, next uh -huh. visit. Okay, well, this is, here. here is, you know, the information. Take it home, digest it, and we'll talk about it again next time. We even set up a little longer appointments to discuss those. Yeah. Interesting. All right then. Good to know. I was not aware. <laughs> You're blowing the mind. I, I was gonna say this is the one where I knew, and I knew this would happen too. I <laughs> did really should have just. Yeah, I'm glad it's recording, so yeah. I can go yeah. back and take notes. Well, and I think there. we should. Was it Lex? Um, different anesthesia too, a little bit with the mm -hmm. spinal. And I, I don't want to get into the the specifics because I'm not anesthesia, but the anesthesia is a smidge different too, so it works a little bit different. Interesting. All right. Mm -hmm. um, wear my own clothes if possible. Is that a an issue it, that it honestly comes down? I think sometimes people just want to be like, can I wear my sports bra? Or can I um, bring a cute hospital gown from home? Yeah, that's for the after thing. Everyone's doing this for, for, for labor. labor. For just, labor. Let's be honest. Because I mean, let's you're not going to want to keep it afterwards, are you? Do you ever after thing? this whole like doing it? Do, no, it gets too I'm messy. I'm sorry, it looks no, cute. it looks so <laughs> cute. It makes cute pictures. Like what? it's so messy. It's you know? a hospital gown. Yeah, but it, no, it's you're, but they're polka dots and little. No, but don't you want to wear it after your pictures? Like with I your nurse, you baby, gold. or your like skin, skin. Dots, okay. I think it's cute. I think it's cute, but I think I'm more of a postpartum girl. I'm all about like using the hospital stuff and walking around <laughs> and watching. <laughs> or at least or have something you don't mind disposing of. Sure. Perhaps. Yeah. Oh, and that's what I tell patients sure. too when they bring clothes for postpartum. I'm like, you know, black yoga. Pajama pants, maybe your husband's pajama pants that are too big that you don't want or something. Use those because there's, <laughs> there's a little blood involved. And you still look pregnant. Yeah. Or the like, ones that you don't be excited to yeah. like go back to your old PJs. Well, or I mean, jeans. you're you're still like you need the same clothes pretty much that you wore. Yeah, yeah. like what Abby was talking about earlier. And she's off camera. Her outfits for before, during, and after. Before, during, and after, which I thought was yeah. crazy until this arrived in the mail. And I was like, well, hot dog. I do think it'll work before, during, and after. But it's got the stretch yeah. so you yeah. can tie it however but um I think it was that was something that was pointed out after and this is such a terrible example to bring up because we don't have lamb squads that come in after most deliveries but um uh Princess Kate 
when mm-hmm. she left the hospital and I mean she left day of walked out in heels. Okay. Mm-hmm. She has so yeah. She's <laughs> lovely and heroic and what have you. But that was pointed out that she was showing I mean the fact that yeah. she still had a belly was something People that were was like talked about. she's so brave. I mean yeah. God bless her. That was great. Uh-huh. But at the same time what do y'all think happened in my so my like, leggings and t shirt and I yeah. Like, you don't lose that recommended high. 25 to 35 uh, to 40 to 45 pounds right as right. the baby comes out. It's, mm-hmm. it's so unfair yeah. that we criticize our own, you know, even just getting together. You know, we're all like making sure lipstick and everything is on and mm-hmm. we do it for each other and it's kind of sad. It's very true. And let that be a life lesson to all of us. <laughs> all right. So stay hydrated by drinking clear liquids as long as the baby and I are doing well. So is that a preference over an IV or is that, how How would you define it? Some that? people, I think, just want to know, can mm-hmm. they drink? Can they have fluids? Yeah. Can they, um, yeah. It, it's so hard because people are like, can I eat? Can I eat? Sometimes you don't feel like eating. Yeah, like, you're not super hungry. Even though you're yeah. afraid you're going to be hungry, it's like your body goes into survival, survival mode, mode yeah. and all of your, you don't need to waste energy digesting food. Your energy is going into your massive uterine contractions and all that. Your body doesn't, it's not like anyone ever, no. ever, has been like, God, I could really use some chicken and waffles right now. Like, <laughs> Every no. once in a while you get a couple people that are like maybe waiting for something that got, like a scheduled yeah. section that got bumped. But I mean, I had two really? labors and it, not one point was I like starving. Now, I, can't, I was thirsty, like, but that's my persona. I love, I love water. So, but I wasn't like, can I get a sandwich? I'm like, but I even afterwards they were like, are you hungry? I'm like, oh, you're so hungry when you're pregnant, though. Yeah, I can totally like a, see the fear of oh, being absolutely. like restricted from eating, but a different process comes over you. When you're actually talking in about the middle of it, yeah. You know, yeah. 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 If I get yeah. hungry, it is Danger Will Robinson because yeah. it, I, I mean, it just mm-hmm. it, I become carrier frantic. Slim and, and, but not right now, actually. <laughs> and I don't have any snacks at first, but fear not. I ate lunch right before I came over. Yeah, because I try and protect you. Angry. Oh, nasty. Yeah, yeah, nasty. And breastfeeding will too if you're planning to breastfeed. True. Oh, good to know. All right. We do have a question. So it sounds like we're inspiring some career choices oh. here. Um, so Michelle says, um, what do you think people like about being a labor and delivery nurse and how would you inspire oh, someone so to go down that career path? So I think it kind of, if you're in nursing school, it, my thing is experience, it's kind of like medical school. Try everything. Try um you know, cardiology, try neurology, different places. <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed to have a label. You're totally fine. fine. No label. I was Sorry. just, I have, I have um, a label on mine okay. as well. You may fall in love with something, you know, or you may fall in love with labor. I personally, since the age of five, wanted to be a nurse. My mom's a ER nurse, and I knew I wanted to be a nurse. I knew I did not want to do ER. No offense to all the men out there. It's not my thing. Um, but I always wanted to be, I used to say an obstetrician nurse, but uh, no such thing. So I kind of knew going into it 100%, even in nursing school, even as a tech, um, I worked in oncology, which I loved, um, but it wasn't my calling. So I think it comes down to your calling. Go, shadow it, see if you like it. Um, some people that absolutely think they're gonna love it, they pass out. Um, they come back for more sometimes, but go shadow it. See what your heart says. It's, you know, I, I think that's part of it. I think probably the same with you guys, um, as far as, you know, you love the surgery side, you like the, the mom and baby side of it. So definitely go. Um, experience it all, but you come back to it in yeah. real life. In, in nursing school, you get such short glimpses of everything, so it's really hard. But if you think that it might be something you want to do, ask, shadow, ask somebody. Okay. I hope that helps. Fabulous. Mm-hmm. All right. So, um, have the freedom to move around. As you sorry, we're jumping from topic to topic here, but that was lovely advice and. Very true, and that those opportunities do exist in they do. this health system. Even and I've seen it. So. Even if you inter- sorry not to go back, but <laughs> you interview for something, and you know there may be three or four other people interviewing, but if your heart's in it and you feel like this is meant, it will be meant to be, and it'll work out. So mm-hmm. they see that in you. You know they see that that's the kind of nurse you want to be. Well, and so. then someone drags you into a Facebook Live episode <laughs> today. All right. So the next question, um, or the next preference on this on this rundown that we were looking at earlier, have the freedom to move around as needed. Okay. So mm-hmm. I kind of want to go back to that whole epidural thing. Mm-hmm. Like, you can. How much movement do you have? I I I assumed that you go. And you said you don't, but mm-hmm. that you go dead from the waist down. Can you, you may you, even for a short period of time feel. Pretty kind of numb from the waist down, but then some moms use that time to kind of nap too. If, if you've been in labor for a bit, um, but I think once she, as she said, it kind of, um, it's kind of like an hourglass. You 
know, getting the right amount on each side. Once it kind of evens out, yes, you, you can move around. You can turn over in your bed. You're not walking to the restroom or anything. Yeah. But okay. Yeah. And if you're laboring without an epidural mm -hmm. or up to the point that you have an epidural, you do, are women encouraged to get up and move mm -hmm. around? They are um, to a certain point, I guess we should say. We should preface with very healthy moms, um, babies that look appropriate on the monitor. You sometimes come in and, you know, when we talk about preferences, if your blood pressure is high or your baby doesn't want to cooperate on the monitor or there's something else going on that we need to keep a closer eye, unfortunately, then you are Some medications bit, moms yeah. need, they're, it's not safe for them to be You're walking limited. around. Mm -hmm. But for healthy, healthy, uncomplicated, mm -hmm. um, everybody looks fantastic. Yeah. Yes, if, if that is your... Um, thing you can walk the hall, you can sit on that ball, um, do like I did, dance with my IV pole for an hour. <laughs> I mean, get in the shower. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. We do have two rooms with tubs here at Barnes. You are welcome to use those too. They're jetted. Um, sometimes that feels good. The new building does have more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the new building will have more. But currently, that's where we're kind of at. And even when we set up the new building, we talked about like, um, and we're this is the in. Women in Fen Center that is opening on October first. We'll say yeah. fall. So yeah, fall. Because the um, changes a little yeah. bit. But we set yeah. it up so that you could walk, so that it's not like a dead end, dead end. You mm -hmm. could just walk, um, because for some women, that's comfortable. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting. I realize I'm pointing over here, and no one has any idea where <laughs> we are. So we're on Kings Highway. I think, actually, I have not even built in perspective here, but that's so Kings Highway. No, this is right Barnes there. Jewish Plaza right here. So oh. we are, this is like, if you see where Barnes Jewish is real big, if you're facing Barnes, we're on the right hand side of it in a little brown gotcha. building. Okay, so if you're driving down Kings Highway and see all of the construction mm -hmm. down there, that exactly. is. Um, the but I hope you're hour. not watching Facebook Live while driving. driving. <laughs> no, it's in the rain because it's pouring down rain. Oh, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a delightful day. But that building has been designed, and there were so many focus groups mm -hmm. involved of both clinicians and parents and mm -hmm. um, people to be on one of the official it. builds of it yeah. and to, like put the rooms in. And it was so cool to do, but. That's why they want like different perspectives, like labor nurses, mm -hmm. people, physicians. Like, what is it that the patients want? Well, they want to be able to move around. Mm -hmm. and if we can do it, we can do it. If we can't, we can't. But mm -hmm. we're gonna try. And so that building is designed then with with that goal in mind, which is really nice. And you mentioned um, the next point: use wireless fetal oh, yeah. monitor. You mentioned fetal monitoring. Sorry, I jumped ahead. Yeah. What exactly is fetal monitoring? What can you expect during labor? And what options or preferences can a woman? identify that are not necessarily driven by the clinician or however you phrase it. So fetal monitoring is a belt around your belly that tracks the baby's heartbeat. Oh, so it's just like a, uh -huh. kind of like a heartbeat. Just a monitor. belt. And okay. then you've got a second belt typically that tracks um, contractions. Okay. And at some point in labor for some women, we recommend placing internal monitors. So that is a different conversation. But for this conversation, two soft elastic belts with two plastic circles that monitor uterine tone or contractions and baby's heartbeat. So um, we do have the capacity to do wireless monitoring. So if you do want to walk around the hall, you don't have to be attached to a fetal monitor machine. You mm -hmm. can be free and it'll transmit the Same signal. Same with the tubs. Same with the tubs. Mm -hmm. um, Shower. You may be somebody that can do intermittent monitoring. So during labor, we want to look at the baby's heartbeat and your contraction pattern for a certain amount of time and give you a break. If you are somebody who has a medically complicated pregnancy or for whom we're worried about baby's heartbeat. And the heartbeat, how it looks, the squiggly line, how it looks on a monitor, I wish I had it tracing. Um, it's so it's hard to explain all, it's years of looking yeah, at it. To it's know all what's a proxy not. for us being reassured that your placenta is giving your baby oxygen and nutrients. So there's very typical patterns of that squiggly line that make us say, that's a great oxygenated happy baby, or we're a little worried about this baby, we need to watch closer. So that and monitor gives us really good, yeah, it yeah. gives us some good information. And if you look great and you're low risk, you could, intermittent monitoring would be something you could talk to your doctor about. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fantastic. Um, and this is another one that I know that I was watching something the other day. It was somebody, it was a, a Facebook video of a woman talking about um, the postpartum experience actually, but she started with labor and she's like, it's like these little green people coming in with four fingers every couple of hours. <laughs> and this, and it was so, so funny and horrifying. I promise um, you it's two fingers. It's two. Okay. Okay. So the next one is <laughs> minimize vaginal exams yeah. unless a change in the plan is anticipated. So first of all, yeah. I don't know who would prefer not to minimize exams, but what is what is typical? I mean, what can you normally expect? And that's the thing, with all of these things, I've looked at this and thought, this is my, I, I don't know how many first yeah. time moms are out there, but I would look at this and I, most of it I'm saying, well, I don't know. I like, like, mm -hmm. or like, oh, 
well, like I wouldn't want that. Yeah. Um, I think too, when you're in that moment, you want to know what is going on. Mm -hmm. Am I making change? How much is too much? So on average, I would say about every two to three hours is mm -hmm. kind of our norm. Two hours is probably a little bit more than norm. Um, if your water is broke, we may not check for a little bit. We may kind of just see what your body's doing. Watching the mantra, like she said, looking at the contractions, looking at baby's heart rate. It's the whole picture. Um, we know the more exams you have, particularly when your water's broken, the higher risk you are for developing an infection in around the baby inside the uterus. So um, we will be very conscious of that. I can't speak for all obstetricians right. and all L&D nurses everywhere, but we already know that more exams can lead to infection, especially if you're in an 82-hour induction. Um, so we do try to be a little bit hands-off, and it doesn't necessarily mean that no one is watching you or cares. It just means we're, we're being thoughtful about possible exposure to infection risk. And sometimes okay. we try other things before yeah. we do an exam, like, yeah. okay, the baby's heart rate did X, Y, Z. Well, why don't I try ABC first, and then if we need to yeah. check, we will. Okay. Um, I would like the following to be considered when I am in labor, and I'm going to group a few of these together because they're all things that I just looked at and said, well, I'll be darned. Um, aromatherapy, music, and dim light. Love it all. Is it, are these things that, I mean, is it just a matter of what's relaxing? So we also put on there that if you want these, you have to bring these. Bring them, yes. <laughs> We are not, do you need, um, do you need them not just with a, with a stick lamp or what yeah, exactly? I mean, no, I'm a probably. firm believer, like even these lights in here, and she a lot of times sits in here with dimmer lights, like mm -hmm. I don't like hospital lights. Like, that well, is one it's, thing. you know what, it's better for pictures if you dial it down. So oh, if yeah. we didn't have these fluorescent lights, we'd all look 10 years younger. Uh, <laughs> it's skinnier, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if you want to bring those things, um, some of the rooms do have uh, CD players that work, but I mean, this day and age with our phones and things like that, mm -hmm. make a labor playlist. Make things that, play things that you like that maybe calm you or help you kind of just get in your zen moment. We prefer no candles. You can use like um, those little battery powered um, lights because candles with oxygen. They're fire. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. Fire. I mean, yeah. it's a very large institution. You bring it down. <laughs> I don't know if your insurance is going to cover it. <laughs> so um, please don't bring your candles. But yeah, you can just be your sure. zen. Interesting. All right. Um, breathing techniques and distraction. I know uh, my mom would always talk about with children born in the 80s was would talk about Lamaze. Is that still relevant or what when you say breathing techniques and distraction, what exactly do you mean? So um, I think labor classes kind of come in handy here where they kind of teach you those, you know, how to breathe through the contraction. It's not the hoo hoo. It's more deep breaths because like she said, the placenta is what is supplying your baby. So we want to oxygenate placenta as much as we can. So breathing, try not to hold your breath. When you're in pain, sometimes it's hard to admit, not be like, uh, you just want to mm -hmm. breathe. And sometimes, and I, um, I don't know how to say this, like to come off politically correct, you sound kind of like a dinosaur or we've heard way of different things uh -huh. like when you're in labor, but it's a way to keep you breathing. You're, mm, you're breathing, you're mm -hmm. not stopping your breath. You're, you know, making those noises is a way to breathe. Um, so well, and on top of that, and Lamaze is great. I mean, Lamaze, any any organized structure to feeling prepared and having sort of a bag of tricks to get through that pain mm -hmm. is great. I don't, I don't know if Lamaze is. A, I'm no. sorry, Lamaze. I, yeah, Please educate say, I don't me. Know if <laughs> but I don't know if it's around or I don't hear people talk about mm -hmm. it. But as as a way to organize your mind and your partner's mind to support you and get you through those painful contractions, anything is yeah. right. Mm -hmm. I think it kind of goes back to that whole old breathing style is yeah. what yeah. people think of when they think of Lamaze. And I think you're doing the class, um, we're talking classes next, next week. week. Stay um, tuned. Stay tuned for that. Yeah. So she kind of goes over um, those things with patients and they kind of feel a little bit more empowered to, to kind of tackle that labor. But um, it's, it's honestly just not holding your breath. Well, and it's so funny that you mentioned, you talk about staying active and fit throughout mm -hmm. pregnancy. And in, in any standard workout class that I've been to, I know a lot of times you're like, remember to breathe. Yeah. And you do forget when you're in the mm -hmm. middle of doing something that, and when you're focusing on lifting something or whatever, you do, you're like, oh yeah. Well, you're like, why? And I always why am I reminding you my breath? everyone in the class yeah. at the same time. Mm -hmm. Take a breath. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so massage, a birthing ball, mm -hmm. um, shower, walking in the hall, things yeah. we've all, um, we've addressed. This one I thought was really interesting, and it's something I've heard from um, friends who have gone um, a little bit longer waiting for an epidural or who've opted against them. Um, I would not like to be asked routinely if I would like an epidural, or I would like to be asked routinely. And is that just some, is it a personal preference? I, mean, I think it is. Um, how I kind of preface it, and like I said, this is just me, is as the labor nurse, if you do not want an epidural, and if I walk in and I'm like, what's your pain, Abby? Abby, can you rate your pain for me? It's it's noon. Can mm -hmm. you tell me what, what your pain is? You're going to be like, 
it throws your whole mindset. So if I walk in and I'm like, you know, what do you get for your contraction? Do you need heat packs? Do you want to sit on a ball? What would make you more comfortable? That's keeping you in your mindset. But if we take you from that mindset every hour, and when you're in pain, and we're, they, or you see me coming in, you're like, oh, she's gonna ask me about my pain again. Oh my gosh, I don't, you know, I don't have a good answer. I think that's a good way to kind of help um, guide that, those conversations mm -hmm. about pain medicine. So if you tell me that I don't want to be asked about my pain, if I tell you I'm in pain, it's time for an epidural. That's all I need mm -hmm. to know. It's conversations you just mm -hmm. have to have. Gotcha. And I think having it written down is sometimes helpful. If I come in and you're nine centimeters and it's 7 a.m. and you're like, I gotta get a new nurse, as long as I'm on the same you know, wavelength as your other nurse, it's all good. All right. Um, when it is time to push, and this one, this was another mind blower for me, <laughs> because I really thought you just push when you're laying on a bed. Um, when it's time to push, I would like to try the following positions. I'm just going to read through them and then we'll talk a little bit about the options. Semi-reclining, side-lying, squatting, hands and knees, a squatting bar, uh, or changing position during pushing. Okay, first thing, apparently babies don't come out in two pushes. Always. <laughs> like the movies. Um, yeah. <laughs> even, I mean, I keep I keep hearkening back to the episode of Friends where she had the baby and it was a breech baby and that baby was still out in three pushes mm -hmm. and she didn't have time for an epidural. And I think, well, by God, people have ever delivered babies. Right? <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, are you kicking me out right now? Is that what that was? Because <laughs> that's not how it goes. <clears throat> so, doctor and nurse, do tell us what it's really like. And I know every case is different, but sure. what, what you typically would... I think people tell you what they need. I mean, you may start sort of in that traditional on your back with sort of your knees up, um, and your nurse, your doctor, whoever's pushing with you can get you through some practice pushes, see if you're using the right muscles, if you're getting that biofeedback that you're using the right muscles, and if it's not working, you you know, lay to your side or we'll raise the back of the bed so you could be on your knees and kind of resting on the back and try that way, and you just... But I think the patient really sort of clearly gets to the point where they are in the right spot and the muscles Once are right it, and, they're, they're and they're like, mm -hmm. that's it. And then you figured it out. But just be open to, to trying all the different things. Well, and so that all was the my next question is all the things mm -hmm. um, about, again, so much of this stuff. I look at this and think, well, golly, I don't know. I've never done this before. So I, yeah. you, you, it's hard to dictate or outline this, beforehand. This like your preference, preference mm -hmm. list just did something awesome though that we talked out what all those things were and how mm -hmm. you flip around and then you're going to come to labor after looking at this we're using a little bit of a mock-up we mm -hmm. put together for our group but it's not like official so we can't really no show it and you. it's based but, primarily on the fact that they didn't like the ones that i sent them from the <laughs> and i keep asking questions from those because they're horrifying oh um, you tried to minimize yeah. the horrifying but it <laughs> initiates a conversation when you're in the yeah. office in your comfortable clothes not in pain mm -hmm. and you're just talking to your doctor about how do people deliver and what works and doesn't work so I would say check, if you have a birth plan you're going to take into your provider, check all the boxes in terms of what position you'd like to deliver in. Okay. Because be open to what to whatever works for your body and your baby. Sometimes the babies yeah. are facing a different direction mm -hmm. than usual. And being on hands and knees, for example, is the best way to get the baby out sooner. And it feels better. And it feels better. Yeah. I think that's key, um, what she said about having the conversation ahead of time before you're in pain, before mm -hmm. you're uncomfortable. Which is a big value to yes. the birth preference. Mm -hmm list ahead of time as you get to talk this well and out. I think the more that we talk about it the point that's becoming ever clearer is and we'll reiterate this point later as well is that the most important preference that you state really I think is the provider that you choose and that you have an open conversation that's with that person deep. hey you know what I try or, uh, a group, really? or a group or a group yeah and it's, <laughs> but that's but it, true it's if you're true. not comfortable to like and Katie made that point a little bit earlier too that I mean it's you should be able to have these conversations beforehand, and if you can't, sure. then or, and to have someone that you trust to guide you through. I mean, mm -hmm. one of the mm -hmm. pre-planned or pre-populated plans that I was looking at said something about I would like to be able to, and you can clarify whether this is a realistic option or not, but push when directed or push as I feel it, push when I want to. And I thought, well, I mean, shouldn't you be able to trust the person who's down there to catch mm -hmm. the baby as to what they think mm -hmm. is going to be the most effective. I, I, I know that I do, and there's a lot out there right now about mm -hmm. directed pushing versus um, not directed pushing. So I think not directed pushing comes a lot from not having an epidural. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of times those moms can feel, even sometimes with an epidural, you can feel. There are times when the epidural's strong enough that 
you need somebody to tell you how you're pushing, if you're pushing mm-hmm. in the right spot, mm-hmm. and when to push. Because you're like, a lot of times they feel the contraction coming on. I'm like, okay, and they're like, I need to push. Mm-hmm. But more important than any document you can come up with, I think, is to find someone that you trust mm-hmm. and that you are willing to hand over some of the most critical hours well, of your your life to. It's your life and your mm-hmm. baby's. I mean, mm-hmm. and that's how I looked at it um, when I first actually came, because I delivered with this group too. So um, the physician at the time, I was like, I trusted her 100% with my life and his life. Like, mm-hmm. that was it. I'm like, if something's going to happen, and, I don't, and these guys here on labor and delivery too, I was like, I know they've got it. Mm-hmm. And so I think if you leave your office feeling like deflated, like mm-hmm. they don't want me to have my birth or they don't want me to um, have a vaginal delivery after my C-section, get a second opinion. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And you, second it, opinions are available, and that's the other thing I know all of us sure. worry about offending practitioners oh or whomever, mm-hmm. but I have yet to talk to a doctor who is offended by mm-hmm. a second opinion. Many of them will say, here are some names of people that I trust yes. and that I would recommend. Mm-hmm. Um, you're welcome to do your own research, but um, this is at least a starting point, and it's not, it's it's nothing accusatory, it's just no. a, an it's Personality yeah. too, like sometimes mm-hmm. personalities just don't mesh. Mm-hmm. All right, so... Um, if I deliver vaginally, I would like to view the birth using a mirror. <laughs> I should have, I almost brought a mirror because I was like, Abby would be like, you tilt it and uh-huh. that really helps. I have people. actually, a friend of mine talks, yeah. I, I did say that to a girlfriend of mine who's had two, she's pregnant with her third now. And she said, you know what, as horrifying, and she's a physician as well, but she said, as horrifying as it sounds, Seeing it made me know when I was pushing correctly exactly. and when I wasn't. Mm-hmm. So and you feel you get an immediate sense of success. Like mm-hmm. I am doing this right. When I push, I see the baby's head. Mm-hmm. If you yeah. can't feel it, yeah, yeah. Um, the room to be as quiet as possible. To keep talking to a minimum during pushing. That is our goal. <laughs> to change positions. Or can you have someone? I mean, I know I'm someone. And this I use the dentist as an example. I want to know everything you're doing. Yeah. At all times and. Is that just something to communicate with the physician? Yeah. Or? A lot of times for those people that don't want to know, they'll tell you, I don't want to know when you're doing this. Mm-hmm. Like, especially like IVs, I think that's typical. Like, don't tell me when oh, you're doing Oh, needles are a different story. I don't want to lie to anybody else. I yeah. do not want to know, but okay, that's yeah. just me. Mm-hmm. So it's communication. We kind of figure, I think that just comes with years of practice, is figuring that part out. Same with like the, when you were talking about the pushing, like trust them to know, you know, maybe you should turn on your left side. Maybe you should turn on your right side. It just, it's years of, of knowledge. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. <laughs> to touch my baby's head as it crowns. Some really? people love that. That really is it's cool. like the mirror, but okay. if you want to do it, if you <laughs> don't want to do it, that's fine. But yeah. yeah. Just reach down there and they'll guide you. Okay. Okay. You're like, uh, no. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, I kind of feel the same right now. <laughs> like, All right then. Okay. <laughs> no one has to do no. any of this. We no, just put it out there. The fact that it's an option is still amazing to me. <laughs> Again, I didn't need eyeliner today. My eyes are so big. Um, to delay the clamping, this one I think is really interesting. To delay yeah. the clamping of my baby's umbilical cord. First of all, why would you do that and what does it mean? To delay clamping, delay cord clamping. Are you doing a thing with peds? Um, so is peds going to do a face yes. live? Yes, they are. Ask them. Table okay. it because it's a, it's a thing it for is. sure and we're starting to do it okay. for term. But We used to do it for preterm babies only. We still, we, we do it routine for preterm babies. Now we're starting yeah. to do it for term babies because yeah. we think babies do better. But have peds okay. do this. Sorry, I the misunderstood thing. the question. It's yes, new. we are doing it's a new-ish thing for term babies. A conversation later yeah. with... When um, we did this, yeah. it was, this hadn't even been discussed as for... I love that all of us talk with our hands. Yes. yes. When yes. we watch this later, <laughs> all of the <laughs> cookie. I used to work, this is a side story, I used to work in television, and when I, I, I was got to the point that they wouldn't let me hold the microphone packs anymore, because I would talk with them, and I broke so many, because I'd throw them, oh so I have to be careful. I tell patients things. things over the phone, and I'm like, this does this, and I'm yeah. like, I'm on the TV. Yeah. Yeah. Well, apparently <laughs> at Disney World, people who are in those costumes still smile for pictures, so I figured, you oh, know, that no, makes total no. sense. Um, all right, so no. next question. My partner to cut, and in every movie, dad swoops in mm-hmm. and cuts the umbilical cord. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, this one is my partner to cut the umbilical cord if appropriate and if baby is doing fine, mm-hmm. or to cut the umbilical cord myself mm-hmm. if appropriate and the baby is doing fine. Sure. So is that, I mean, standard? We'll standard say, does routine. anyone want to cut? Yeah. And it might be grandma, it might be big sister, it might be mm-hmm. dad, you it might own. be mom. I cut both of my own. Well, mm-hmm. you're a nurse. That's yeah. different.
But like, I loved it. It was kind of like this, like, timeline. It's like, it's fun. It's, it's like the ribbon on the present. Yeah. You're like, yeah, I did this. Okay. <laughs> it's like my own prize. <laughs> At that point, I'm like, and I'm done. Yeah, exactly. So That's what I mean. It's kind of like you're like, huh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you can ask, and, and whoever thinks they might want to do it uh-huh. in the moment, a lot of times it's like, oh, no. Or sometimes dads, yeah, bless their hearts. It's a, a lot. There's a baby. Little, there's they're fluid, emotional. There's blood, and they're like, oh. And that's okay. We'll, we can cut it. We'll cut it, yeah. Um, and this one's really important, has become a very hot conversation over the last few years, to place the baby immediately on my chest in skin to skin. Yeah. It's so automatic. before it's bathed, before anything, baby goes right onto mom's chest. And I'm going to ask this question, we'll get back to this point in one second, but I think it's so interesting. Why in every picture you see of someone with a new baby, do they not have anything? I mean, they're covered with a blanket up to here. Are you not wearing anything? Oh, typically we've undone the gown. So the gown has snaps that go on both sides. Uh-huh. And a lot of times, pre more pre-C-section, um, we kind of undo those snaps. And so sometimes I think by the time okay. we get the picture, the, it, the, the gown's okay. there. Um, it's just a little bit further. Lower. Yeah. 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 Okay. No, no, it's there. You're not naked. Interesting. You okay. can be. If you're you hot, be. a lot of people Modesty take the gown off. And they're like, it's, it's it's hot. You're not going to care. <laughs> Well, yeah. I just thought, I've, I've seen yeah. so many of those pictures, and I've always wondered, is it just something that is that part of labor or yeah. whatever? But okay. For some women, yes. So other women that are very, that have some modesty still are first time, it's that fear of, I don't want to take it if I'm covering one. I mean, mm-hmm. I, honestly, yes, you everybody's seen everything, right? But you're not. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then skin to skin. Can you explain what it is and the purpose of it? So babies who go straight to mom's chest, skin to skin, not wrapped up like a burrito, cheek to cheek, um, but straight on mom's chest. Uh, naked and naked. Are calm, <laughs> they don't cry as much. The more baby is agitated and crying, they're burning through their the sugar in their body. Mm-hmm. Um, they temperature control better. They are more likely to initiate breastfeeding sooner. So there's all these things. So we do all the things that the babies want to, you know. Mm-hmm. Skin to skin is our now standard practice here. You don't have to. It's more of an opt out than an opt in, yes. which okay. is a big shift in the in the last three years here. Uh, yeah. And I mean, some people maybe, want the baby five, yeah. cleaned up and dried up and then brought to them, mm-hmm. and that's totally your choice. But you will be automatically offered skin to skin and just communicate with your provider if you don't want to do that. But it's really it's so many times moms are like, why isn't baby crying? Why isn't baby crying? Because baby's in the crying. movies, the baby's on a warmer, uh-huh. away, alone. I mean, not alone. They're with people who care, but still, like, <laughs> yeah. But not with their mommy. A newborn that's yeah. skin to skin is just like, uh, and it's so cute to watch them because their eyes are their open, eyes are so big. They're looking around. Yeah, it's yeah. my babies were born in the two different eras of barns. I guess you could say, like my first one, burritoed up and brought to me. I was like, okay, you know, it was fine. But then the second one, it's it's such an instinct. And I don't know how else to describe it. And that does not come from being a labor nurse to just want your baby. Like, I don't know mm-hmm. how many times, even before we did skin yeah. to skin automatic, moms would want to reach for their baby. And it, they almost were like, but now it's like, mm-hmm. yes, take your baby, hold your baby. So yes. it's, it's amazing. That's and such a funny point. And it goes back to the people in the room too. Mm-hmm. And, and how much you're willing to share that moment. I, I will never forget um, my brother and sister-in-law who have lived at the time in Chicago. We were all visiting them. And she went into labor and oh, wow. so had the baby <laughs> with both sides of the family there. Very, very conveniently timed. Mm. It does not um, happen like that. No, <laughs> no. Um, and, but immediately if she, they had a couple hours skin to skin and, and doing family time, but then we went in there. And I will never forget going in there and she said, she, and she, I don't remember if she asked if I wanted to hold him or whatever, but I took the baby and was holding him. And I will never forget looking at him and thinking, oh my gosh, she has worked all day to get this baby out. And she probably wants nothing more than to hold him. And here I swooped in and took him from her. <laughs> you know, and it's just that it, it is it, it is clearly a personal preference of how many sure. people want. But I think it is, and I've talked to her about it since, and she said, I have no memory of that, but okay. That's um, a, a fog. You have to have more children. But yes, yes, <laughs> yes. She she had the fog, no but question But you also want it. to share with people. These are the people mm-hmm. you love, right? Like, they've been there with you. They've helped you. And so sometimes it, it is okay. If mom's offering you to hold the baby, they're okay with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They want to share and snatch the baby. <laughs> as long as she didn't like rip off your shirt and just get a skin, um, it's okay. 
before we get to the C-section questions, and I, I know I promised you a lot of time to talk about the placenta later, uh, but oh, can yeah, you yeah, talk yeah. a little bit about I what options are ready. out there? I was going to say, we'll, we'll get into that one, probably have another episode with you yeah. in a few weeks, because I know you have a lot of thoughts on the matter. Um, I am remembering that correctly, right? You do have I don't think thoughts. I'm coming for that one. <laughs> <laughs> she loves it. Someone I was reading, and she you get all the it. movie stars eat them in pill form, apparently. Um, but the... Katie's favorite. The... Delivery doesn't end with the cutting of the cord. Oh, no. no. Okay, so there's more to come. So you <laughs> deliver then the placenta. And this comes into the birth preference thing too, because oh, some people want to take their placentas home. Mm -hmm. So, okay. um, the placenta. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Explain the placenta. Abby, so sorry. Abby. Oh, I'm sorry. I've never had a her good poker face. face. I've not known her for very long, but I know that her face is making faces. Okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Hey, so, and I'm not judging, judging the, the decision. Okay. I, it's just all very bewildering to so me. So there is an organ. There's an yes. organ that is inside your uterus. Are okay. <laughs> they are, they're all, they're it's really inside hard. your uterus, and it is blood vessels that are getting oxygen and nutrients to baby. And it's stuck to your uterus so that maternal blood vessels mm -hmm. are shifting oxygen and nutrients across to the baby's blood vessels to go to the baby. Similarly, it's taking away waste from the baby back to the mom so that you then... Lucky us. Yes. <laughs> um, so, it's got to come out. So, typically within 30 minutes of baby being born, and you're distracted. You're holding your baby or, you know, or we're doing our stitches. Don't feel bad if you need stitches. Almost okay. everyone does, first babies particularly. There, there's things going on. We're making sure you're not bleeding, making sure you're comfortable. And then the placenta will be born, and it feels like, I've only had two C-sections. I don't know what it feels like. It but really it feel like anything. It, a lot of people say they feel relief. Yeah, like, it's, it's more like, like a pressure little, like, and then relief. Yeah, it's not like delivering the baby. No, 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 it's just a little, okay. a little like no. better now. It's you know, if you go over a big hump, this is long. It's yeah, like, it's out, and you're like, huh? Okay, yeah, yeah it's kind of weird. And you so can fun. take it home if you want. We'll talk more at our placenta talk about okay. it. Okay. Um, some people do things with it. I have a PowerPoint. Okay. <laughs> All right, guys. I cannot wait to learn more. It is such an See, amazing I, organ, though, because your body makes one every time you get pregnant. How crazy is that? You make a whole new organ besides yeah. a person. We had a twin different. delivery this um, week, and there were organ? twin placentas, and I was like, whoa. I mean, it's it's never boring to me. I right. think I'm in the right job. Yeah, I think you job. are. And yeah. um, I, I was think bringing I'm med right students over. I was like, look at this. It's I, so cool. And my look of horror is more in my mind when you say you can take it home. I'm thinking, like, oh. in a glass jar to put on the mantle? <laughs> I mean, what do you do I mean, do it's your it? organ. So, you do what you want with it, but typically, no. It is not It is not a matter of judging the decision to take it home. It's just a, well, what are you going to do, do with it? it? Stay so, tuned. Stay tuned. We'll come back to that later. All right, so if delivered. It's fascinating. It is fascinating. Yeah, we love our placentas. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, if delivered by C-section, I would like for so and say to be present for someone. Can we go back to present. vaginal? Yeah. One valuable thing that has come up a lot by going through birth preferences with people ahead of time is writing a misperception that a family member can do the delivery. I've had this, I oh, can't even tell you. Like, I, my birth preference is I'd like my mom to deliver the baby. Oh. Yeah, or a sister. It's not a uncommon. No. Or my okay. sister who's yeah. a nurse. Or my husband who's a firefighter and did some EMS classes. Like, EMS training. Not some. The firefighter's amazing. But, like, mm -hmm. somebody in the family, like... Somebody who's not an MD. So, it's really good to go through this ahead of time in the office, not in the moment. Like, you're pushing and you're like, but I really wanted my husband to deliver. And that's... That's something that I would say I'm not comfortable with. I feel like I spent a really long time training and I have been practicing a, a long enough time that I feel really confident that I can protect your perineum. Google your it. what? Perineum. We're, we're allowed to Google that one? Google it. It's not a bad word. Is that the it's, thing that you're supposed to do the olive oil with? I was wondering yeah. who's, or the PMS. Yeah. Sorry, did you ever So it, the there's phone? techniques <laughs> to delivery yes. that can minimize your tearing. Okay. Yes. So that's legit. What? Sorry, olive the olive oil. oil. I'm sorry. So I we're don't back have to that. But like, there's a reason. There. Okay. I would there's say, a you're there. talk to your doctor. Who knows? They mm -hmm. may be like, I'd love for your husband to deliver a baby. Just have that conversation ahead of time, not in the delivery room where you're disappointed if your doctor's not comfortable with that. Gotcha. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fair. I never would have thought about that. Okay. Same with. Well, we'll talk about with C-section. <laughs> um, dads cannot cut the cord in the C-section. It's 
on the Ohio after delivery. That's the baby warmer. Yes, sorry. I was going to say, a, a river? What we are we take talking? the baby so to Ohio. Ohio, Ohio <laughs> okay. state, sorry. To I worked the... here a month before I figured out what an Ohio was. I kept thinking people were saying, like, <laughs> sorry, I go back to my old Something like far away, like, huh. well, that baby's over in Ohio. Like, I thought it was so like Ohio. a, <laughs> it's like a brand, so, yeah. is it a brand of a baby yeah. warmer? Yeah. I still okay. live in Ohio. It's probably the oldest Ohio. dinosaur brand there is, but okay. yes. Um, baby so warmer. a baby is, um, we'll go over to the warmer, and then dads or in the room, aunties, um, can cut the cord, but not Trim it. during. It's already yeah, cut. It's, like, it's not the actual, we've had people be really crestfallen and delivering because yeah. they couldn't do it more like that's a sterile field. It's like so, a major oh, okay. surgery. Yeah. Gotcha. I mean, if you were having your heart operated on, you wouldn't want somebody to come in and be like chomping their gum over it. Yeah. You know, you just, we try to minimize. What was the episode of? Oh gosh, I, 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 my uh, brothers Seinfeld. are going to be so disappointed. The, what did he drop the, in there? Um, junior mints. The junior mints. Oh yes, yes. 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 Thank you. Oh, yes. I'm really so disappointed Thank I didn't know that. Sorry. Thank you. Um, if I deliver by C-section yeah. or cesarean section, I'd like for in name a person that you yeah. would want to be present. You can have one um, visitor or one uh, support person with you in the operating mm -hmm. room. Okay. That is anesthesia standard. Oh okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's gotcha. just, there's not a ton of room, and once again, we're trying to keep that area sterile. Mm -hmm. Um, for the drape to be lowered to see the baby born, do explain. And so we've also, well, and we've kind of gone to, we have the option for clear too. Yeah. So we have, and lots of hospitals have a clear drape, so it's opaque during the surgery, but we can pull down the piece of blue paper so you have a clear view to okay. your baby, and you can even, like, through the plastic, touch your baby, say, hi, baby, I love you, baby, and then we clean the baby off, cut the cord. The goal um, is still within five Just to show you the baby, baby with yeah. you, but yeah. But some okay. people want to see the baby right away. So lowering the drape or your mm -hmm. your obstetrician can kind of hold the baby up like Lion King or, but oh. we want to show you your baby. Cause, yeah. And it also comes down to that, you know, if patients are not expecting to have a C-section and they do, they kind of feel like, you know, yeah. they're missing out on that, seeing their baby initially born. So when you have that drape, that, that takes all that out. So you, mm -hmm. you have that feeling. And we already talked about the trimming mm -hmm. of the umbilical cord and um, that skin to skin is possible after a mm -hmm. C-section. Okay. Yeah, I mean, in the OR. What is our rate right now? It's like 80 some percent for skin to skin in the OR after C-sections. Oh, the wow. goal is with five to seven maybe? minutes to have baby and moms together. Yeah. Those babies transition sometimes a little bit different. Um, but for the most part, we get moms. The other thing, I, I, poor moms, I think, um, sometimes don't anticipate. They kind of sometimes feel nauseous. And so we encourage mm -hmm. dads, too, to have. I always tell dads, even if you're thinking maybe, put a button-down shirt on. Because I've had dads in the order, they're like, how do I get this off? How do I get it off? And you're like, oh, uh, let me get some scissors. <laughs> or you take it around the thing and you just you help them. But having dads prepared to do it, uh -huh. and there's nothing better than having this dad who was like, I'm not doing that, be like, <laughs> and they're just so excited. Yeah. I mean, they, they're like moms. They, they just want to snuggle the babies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, we have a question. Jocelyn wants to know how long you're typically in a recovery room after a C-section. Oh, you go back to, here, we go back to our labor rooms mm -hmm. for about two hours. Um, and then in that time, we're checking your blood pressure, checking to make sure your fundus is nice and firm, check on Top your uterus. Mm -hmm. um, if you're planning to breastfeed, we assist with that. If you're planning to pump, we assist with that formula feeding, whatever it's going to be, we're going to help you. Um, and then you guys go to your postpartum room. Okay. Um, cord blood. Banking it. Mm -hmm. Or for banking it, having the hospital bank it through the St. Louis Cord Blood Bank. Mm -hmm. Or and so that's donation. 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 Okay, yeah. so mm -hmm. cord blood donation uh -huh. versus what do you Private call? banking. Private banking. I know um, there's a... What is cord blood banking? First of all, what is the point of it? And do you have a recommendation for people about how to approach it? I kind of leave it. There's two, is it still two main companies yeah. that do private cord blood banking? And it's the theory is that there are cells in your baby's umbilical cord blood that in the future could be used therapeutically if your baby or someone in your family that was a match genetically with blood issues. I don't want to go. I'm trying mm -hmm. to keep it high level. Like, you could use that in the future. So um, stem cell treatments or cancer different cancer treatments. Um, it's money, it's expensive um, for a lot of people, and I think you just have to talk to the company and, and see what the, the finances look like, and then also maybe even, um, who'd be good to talk to? I was gonna say pediatricians. I know, I mean, it's really split. I know a lot of pediatricians themselves who didn't bank, mm -hmm. um, but you can, you can donate cord blood. Yeah, okay. you can donate. So you pay for an initial box, 
you pay to have it uh, an initial fee to have it stored, and then you pay monthly or yearly or whatever to store that for as long as you want it stored. Yep. Um, but maybe you have a family history of some stuff, mm -hmm. and maybe to you it would be worth the peace of mind and go for it. Um, I don't. I can't say that I'm aware of any really compelling medical advice yeah. to do the private banking. And mm -hmm. if things change, I'll change my counseling a little bit. But I just, I, I don't, I don't know enough mm -hmm. about it. It might change a little with delayed cord clamping too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, or there is the option to donate. The mm -hmm. Word Blood Bank at Cardinal Glennon um, is who we are affiliated with. That's who everybody uses on the Metro East and the Missouri side. And honestly, you sign some papers, mainly saying you haven't done this or that, um, I get a couple of tubes of blood drawn and you can donate. It's free. That's it. You get a little mm -hmm. magnet in the mail and they're amazing. <laughs> and we will talk about breastfeeding um, and the options of how to feed baby best extensively in the next couple of months. Um, but right now it is, as far as birth preferences are concerned, it's important to understand what your preference mm -hmm. is going to be going, yeah. whether it's breastfeed yeah. exclusively. And in a perfect feed. world, that's a discussion you start in your first trimester. Yeah. yeah. I was at my first appointment, I think. Yeah. So just we like do, answer, start... getting rid of misconceptions, mm -hmm. really, if someone chooses not to breastfeed, just to make sure that your doctor feels like you're, um, you know the truth and not rumors and speculation mm -hmm. um, about it. And if you don't want to breastfeed, that's your call. Yeah, it's, we don't want to shame people. No. And sometimes I think if they, you know, sometimes we'll put it on the chart so that way when different providers go in or if I ask questions, I'm not like, you know, are you planning to breast or formula feed? And because I use breast first alphabet, that's how I am. My, my brain is alphabetical. Mm -hmm. They're not like, there she, she thinks I should breastfeed. No, I'm just asking kind of what your preference is. But if I go into it knowing 100% she wants to formula feed, I'm not even going to bring it into the picture because I'm not shaming somebody. Mm -hmm. Whereas if somebody's on the edge, I'm just here to provide both sides of it. You just got to kind of be in the middle and, and offer the best yeah. information. Okay, um, and then if my baby is a boy, talk about circumcision mm -hmm. ahead of time, whether you want it done at the hospital, we'll do so later, or um, if you do not want circumcision. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so that is the full list of questions that we had. Please feel free to keep sending yours in. I think my last one, I, I would say, if there is a piece of advice from each of you, yes, exactly. Are you okay? I think, <laughs> I think I'm gonna be all right. Uh, nothing was as horrifying as, ex as I expected, and honestly, the explanations made me feel a little bit better. I'm still concerned about a placenta and a glass jar on the mantle, but we promise we're not going to do that. Okay. Um, if you had, um, I'm put both of you on the spot, advice yeah. for um, a support person in the Ooh, advice for the support it, person, whether it's partner, dad, husband, whatever it is, what would your piece of advice be? Roll with it. Yeah. They. Just roll with it. You can make it or break it, so. <laughs> <laughs> if they're hot, get them a fan. If one second later they're cold, take the fan away. If one second later they're hot, bring the fan. I mean, just yeah. just roll moment to moment with whatever's going on. And they want an ice chip, you feed them ice chips. I mean, it may sound <laughs> mundane, they're like, you have two arms at work. <laughs> I don't care if they want an ice chip. You do what they want. And also, yeah. you know, I think it's, if, so, if mom wants something and it doesn't work out, don't bring it up later. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think it was one. some article I read where mm -hmm. it, it goes back to the epidural conversation where she had said going in, I do not want an epidural, mm -hmm. and had gotten to the point that she's like, all right, uncle, bring it. And mm -hmm. he was like, are you sure? And I mean, I think questioned multiple times over, and she said, now looking back, I know in my right mind, I'd have been totally fine with him confirming this choice yeah. with me, but in my labor mind, I was not. Yeah, no. <laughs> and she and bless their hearts, they get so much flack dads more mm -hmm. specifically, even even grandma, like moms, like mm -hmm. maternal, like your mom, because that's your mom, and when you're in pain, that's who you want sometimes. Um, they get a lot of flack, but they are amazing support, and I mean, couldn't really do it without them. I mean, there's mm -hmm. no way I could have gone through two labors without my And mom-mom mom families, mom-moms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and mom-moms. I mean, whoever your support person is, mm -hmm. I mean, it is so scary and To see amazing. someone you love going through that, you feel so, I would imagine you would feel so helpless. Helpless, but... It is so nice to have them there, and even if it is something as silly as ice chips or, you know, it's good to have them there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that would be my next question of, especially women who have elected to have a baby independently. Yeah. How, I mean, and I know many strong women who'd be like, I can, I can do this on my own. Mm -hmm. Would you recommend finding someone to be there with you? Typically, they have a very good support system. Yeah. If okay. they're a single mom um, to be, and they're, sorry, the 
alarms are all going off from the thunderstorm. Oh, yeah, I'm like, well, um, well, I'm not doing too well with thunderstorms. Anyway, um, they usually have a support system. They have their mom. They have their sister. They have somebody, mm-hmm. a best friend. A lot of times they're not going into it alone. And sometimes and shout out to our doula community. And doulas, yes. Mm-hmm. Great, um, great um, option for people events, yes. who are... Um, Great resource. So, and again, going back to that personality, that magic, you know, do you trust the person? Is yes. it a good fit? Mm-hmm. Like, same as with your obstetrician, if you're interested in doula care and you are sort of out there in the community, interview, meet more than one yeah. person. Like, get a feel for if that's going to be a good personality in such a high intensity, high stress scenario. Because it comes back to those people that you love the most sometimes drive you a little crazy. Um, mm-hmm. So, when you take that, um, aspect out and you put a stranger who you, not I shouldn't say stranger, you've met them a few times, but that can, can keep you on track mm-hmm. and just be there specifically for you and know that next step, sometimes that is helpful. And like mm-hmm. I said, we have some amazing doulas um, within the community and seek them out. They're, they're really good. Mm-hmm. That's great advice. And I'm going to give you a minute to jump on your soapbox if you want to about, um, <laughs> don't about you you'll be off the, screen. <laughs> the whole idea that we all have that we can plan every, and I mean, there are a lot of type A women. I'm not going to say I'm not one of them necessarily. I think I'm a lowercase A, but that's, you know, self-assessment. Um, there are a lot of people who, <laughs> who want to plan every single detail. Yeah. And I, I think you pointed out very early when we were discussing this, that it's, it's important to understand what the objective is here. Yes, the objective is um, for you to feel safe and for you to have trust in your providers. Um, the objective obviously is healthy mom, healthy baby. And I think sort of distilling it to that sound bite takes away that there is choice and there is free will and there is preference and all this stuff. And so I don't want to take that away, but I think when things don't go according to check, 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 plan. I think mm-hmm. that it that we've got to have a way to frame that healthier for moms. I've seen moms devastated, mm-hmm. not because their birth was dangerous or their baby didn't have acros of nine. And I mean, mm-hmm. healthy mom, healthy baby, but still struggling with having deviated from this this set of check boxes that are. Or to a large extent, very arbitrary. Mm-hmm. I mean, honestly. So, but I think if you have something really important to you, like I, <laughs> I don't think she's watching. So, but years ago, <laughs> I had somebody who really wanted her baby born to a specific musical artist, mm. and we played the same song on loop for like twenty <laughs> minutes because baby wasn't. You know, I thought it would be a certain baby did not want to be born. I know. That song. Well, it happened, and she was like, and that was fun for me to provide her with that like uh-huh. moment, you know, Stevie Wonder. So anyway, oh, um, I was going to ask who the artist was afterwards. Yeah, isn't she lovely? I mean, that's a pretty amazing birth song, right? It is. Okay. So I mean, there's things we can all do, and that makes me like my job. It makes Katie like her job when we're able to provide those little things. But when it's something to keep, when your body does a thing, like has severe range blood pressures, you didn't fail. No. You can't control that. You just. Um, I just would, I just would encourage everyone to frame it because you end up introducing this element of self-loathing. My body betrayed me. You know, mm-hmm. I ended up with difficult to control diabetes. How can you put that on yourself? You mm-hmm. know, it's that whole mommy thing. You know, it's mm-hmm. hard. It starts early. It does. Yeah. You know, you can't be there for this. You can't do that. You can't, you know what? It takes it back to not every birth is the perfect birth you read about or see on TV or, um, you know, it's what they call romance, or you know, yeah. it's your birth. And in the end, it's going to be yeah. a good story regardless yeah. as long as there's a dating is baby. never like TV dating. Oh no, or your wedding. You know, even a wedding. wedding. Think about like there's something that went wrong in your mm-hmm. wedding, right? Like something that you're like, oh, there's always a little, yeah. a little. TV and it's either a good out. story or you forget it later, one right. or the other. All right. Yeah. Well, Cameron Christman Robbins, thank you so much for joining us again today. And Katie Drennan, thank you so much for being here. We'll be dragging you you both back again (laughs) very soon. Next week, we're here to talk about uh, birthing classes, which will be a lot of the same ideas, but you'll, I'm guessing, see a little bit more of that birthing ball. And I think I'll be wearing pants. All right. (laughs) Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next Friday at 1. Thank you.